Good evening, everybody. Um, as already said, my name is Jermaine Turnquist. I'm happy to have this opportunity to depart some knowledge with you guys today. I hope and pray that it meets you well, that you're able to understand, and I will do my best to deliver this message. Alrighty, so our topic today is an intro to hydroponics. It's meant to, to provide to you all the basics, the basic knowledge that you would need to operate a hydroponic system and produce for yourselves hydroponically, whether you want to do it um, in your backyard or for a business. Alrighty. Nothing else, that is me to the left, and to the right is my partner, Mrs. Carlene Miller. We are co-owners of Grow Life Urban Supplies. Okay, alrighty, so an intro to hydroponics. Let's get started. So to the left, that is myself there, Jermaine Turnquest. To the right is my partner, Carlene Miller. We are co-owners of Grow Life Urban Farm and Supplies, and we're happy to be able to present this to you this evening. Below, you can see our website, www.growlifesupplies.com. You can visit there to get more information on everything that you will see and hear about in this presentation. So, what's hydroponics? Simply, hydroponics is the process of growing plants without the use of soil. All of the plant's nutritional needs are provided via the water supply. So what that means is, when you have your hydroponic system, you usually have a tank, and you would add your water to the tank, and you would actually add the nutrients to that tank, and that is what feeds your plants. Hydroponics is not new. Hydroponics can be tracked back as far as the tank times of the Mayans, right? Uh, not Mayans, the Aztec civilization. The Aztec civilization is where hydroponics was first known to be used on a large scale for production. The technique was lost during after that time period, but it was picked back up again during the 1920s to 1930s, and it's taken off ever since. So, th so those of you who may think hydroponics is something new, something modern, yes, it has been modernized, but it's been used for a very very long time. Some of the pros of hydroponics, and there's pros and cons to everything as we know. You can go pretty much anywhere. There's no worrying about whether or not the ground is fertile enough for you to grow because you're not using the ground, you're not using soil, period. You can grow more with less space. You can utilize anywhere between 40 to 50% more space than you would with traditional farming or gardening. So imagine you got what's called a hydroponic tower in the back of your yard, and you probably only have about three by three feet of space, or even two by two feet, but yet you're still growing 20 plants within that space. Hydroponics allows you to do that. Labor is decreased significantly. And the reason for this is because common gardening practices are no longer required. So things that you would usually do when you go in your yard, you'd have to dig up and remove rocks, you'd have to till the ground, you'd have to um, do a lot of weeding and mulching to prepare the ground, and also fertilization. Those things are no longer required. Another advantage of hydroponics is you have the ability to grow year round. So unlike traditional farming where you have a growing season, with hydroponics, Every day of the year, 365 days a year, season. Uh, cons. Usually when it comes to hydroponics, if you're trying to do it at somewhat large scale, it can usually be quite expensive. It's not cheap. It's actually not even cheap as a hobby, per se. So that's something you want to keep in mind. Most hydroponic gardens and farms can be heavily affected by power outages. And the reason for this, and this is something to keep in mind, the majority of hydroponic systems out there require electricity in order to either operate pumps, lights, and stuff like that. And once electricity is lost and those pumps can no longer circulate the water, 
that can actually cause damage to your crops depending on how long um, your system is down. Another con attribute to hydroponics is many hydroponic systems are clone, uh, pruned to clogging. This is something you want to keep in mind when choosing the types as well as you definitely want to keep up the maintenance. Maintenance is key when it comes to keeping your system functional and at peak performance. All right. One key factor that cannot be ignored with hydroponics, it shouldn't even be ignored when you're growing in soil, is pH. It's very important to understand pH. So what is pH? pH is a measurement, essentially. And what you're measuring is the acidity, the neutrality, and alkalinity in a liquid solution. So let me break that. On the screen, uh, to the right of the screen is a meter, right? You would, that's a pH meter. You would insert that into your tank and it will give you a reading. And that reading would be anywhere from zero to 14. Anything six and below is considered acidic. Anything eight and above is considered alkaline. And seven is neutral. And it's also very important to take into consideration what you want to grow so that you can know how to manage your pH because different plants require different pH levels. Some plants love an acidic environment, like an alkaline, and some want it to be nice and cozy in the middle. Not too complicated. Zero to 14. It comes out saying that your pH is four. The solution inside your tank is acidic. And what I'm referring to when I say solution is the water in your tank, once you've already added the nutrients to it, it's now called the nutrient solution. Alrighty, now let's talk about So you just um, stuck your pH meter into the water and says, well, my pH is it's three. Your pH is so now you're like, okay, but my plant likes a pH of 5.4 or 6. How do you raise that? It's pretty simple. You would use pH adjusters. So these are some examples of pH adjusters to the left, I mean, to the right of the screen. So if your pH is too high, and this is what I mean by it's pretty simple, you would use pH up. If your pH is too low, you would use pH down. It comes in both liquid and dry forms. So as you can see, so far, it's not difficult. Hydroponics is not something that should scare you off. Um, it's a bit scientific, but it's simple science. All righty. Understanding TDS. So what is TDS? TDS stands for Total Dissolved Solids. These solids are particles that you would find in your water. Usually you won't be able to see them with your naked eye. So to test your water quality, you would use a TDS meter, right? An example of this is on the right-hand side of the screen. This is actually the meter that we use at Grow Life. This is how we test um, the salts and particle levels in our water supply. Alrighty, so it's also used to determine nutrient strength. Now, what does that mean? When you add nutrients to your tank or your reservoir, it has a certain strength level and you don't want it to be too weak and you don't want it to be too strong. You want it to be just right to serve your plant's nutritional needs. If it's too strong, it'll probably burn your plants. If it's too weak, your plants won't develop properly. So this meter allows you the ability to be able to assess that at a glance. Alrighty, so as it says there, it, it can also be used as a measurement of water purity, right? So for hydroponics, reverse osmosis water is best. It's best that you use a, a reverse osmosis filter, although this isn't necessary. It is best, you don't have to. For example, we don't use a reverse osmosis filter at the farm. We have a different type of filter and it works very well. All right. 
All right, so your TDS measurement, if you're using reverse osmosis water, should come out to zero or as close to it as possible. If it's truly zero or, or very near to zero, like let's say, let's say it says 0 0.2, 0 0.3, then you know you have some pretty clean water there. When testing your TDS, you use different metrics. So as you see here, it says EC, CF, and PPM. Don't let these terms um, scare you off. They're very simple. EC stands for electrical conductivity. CF stands for conductivity factor. And PPM for parts per million. In the US, most hydroponic growers use the PPM measurement. So you'll see them come out with results that says like 500 ppm and stuff like that. Um, in Europe, they use EC. It stands for electrical conductivity again. And that is what we use at the farm. And the reason why we like to use it, as it says at the bottom, it's very simple and very easy to understand. So a reading for EC will come out to be one, two, three, 1.2, very simple. Already. We're going to be moving on to filtration. Now, the reason it's important to have a filter that goes before your hydroponic system is simply because you want the water to be clean. Before reverse osmosis water is the best water to use, however, it is not necessary. So <clears throat> In the picture to the left is a reverse osmosis filter system. Example of one. And what this will do is completely clean your water and it also has a UV sterilized sterilizer at the top. So it'll also kill bacteria that's in the water. To the right of that is the system that we actually use at our farm. It's, it does the job quite well. We have no problems with it at all and also costs quite a bit less. And it also removes bacteria as well as other things that are found in water that can have a negative impact on your crops. So the way most filters are set up, you have a pre-filter which removes sediment, and then you have a secondary filter that would remove the smaller particles, things such as cyanide, bacteria, and stuff like that, rust flakes, anything like that that can be found in your water, as well as chlorine. In reverse osmosis filters, you would have the pre-sediment filter, and then you'd also have another filter, which is actually the reverse osmosis membrane. All righty. Now, let's talk about hydroponic substrates. And it's very important to have a very good understanding of substrates when you're choosing the hydroponic system you want to use, as well as just the way that you want to grow. So let's get into it. What is a hydroponic substrate? A hydroponic substrate, you're not using soil, right? So you have to use something. You're not growing in soil. So let's go through a few of them. These are the most common. There are a lot more than what I'm about to show you but these are the most common ones that you will come across when you're probably scouring Amazon or just on the internet looking for hydroponic equipment. Hydroton, so the picture to the right is an example of hydroton, also known as expanded clay or lacquer pebbles. This is a very common hydroponic substrate. You can also say medium and it works very well. It's made by heating clay to over 2,000 degrees, causing it to expand into porous, semi-hard, marble-sized pebbles, such as what you see in the picture to the right. It allows for adequate water retention once soaked well. And the reason you want to soak um, your hydrogen well is simply because you do, want to do, you do want water to seep into it so that when you water your plants via the hydroponic system, you want a good, of the water, a good amount of the water to actually stay within the pebbles and soaking them helps them to be able to do that right away rather than over a period of time. Hydrogen pebbles also has uh, the property of being 
an excellent drainage media. So when using hydrogen, hydrogen pebbles, you pretty much don't have to worry about drowning your plants, right? So that's another extra, excellent attribute to them. And because they're so porous and allow for such good drainage, they also allow for a good, a good oxygen supply to your plant's root zone, which is very important. A lot of people don't think about oxygen being provided to plants. We just know plants give us um, oxygen in return, but they actually do absorb ox oxygen through their roots. And it, and it does definitely help to establish proper root growth. If you have a proper and healthy root system, you'll have a really healthy plant as well. Rock wool. Rock wool is probably the most common hydroponic media that you will come across when, when I'm doing some research. It's also known as stone wool. It's made from molten, by basaltic rock, I had to look at that word twice again, <laughs> which is then spun into fibers and formed into different shapes. So in this picture to the right, it's formed into square cubes with planting holes that you would either put your seedling in or a seed. It's very popular in commercial growing. And the reason for that is, well, it's very cheap. You can get a lot of rock wool for consider for a considerably low amount of money. But you must keep in mind it needs to be handled delicately. And the reason for this is because once rock wool is blown up and expanded and formed into those cubes, the capillaries and stuff that are in there are very delicate. So you don't want to squeeze it and ruin those, right? Because those are the open spaces for your plants to spread its roots through. So you want to be very difficult, uh, delicate and handling rock wool. The thing about rock wool is it has mul multiple purposes. You can actually use rock wool for insulation. You can literally insulate your home with rock wool. Another very common and one that I would like to highlight, especially um, another common substrate is coconut coir. Alrighty, so coconut coir is made from shed shredded or pulverized coconut husk. It's mainly processed into fiber pith and chips. Now, how many coconuts we have here in the Bahamas? Exactly. Alrighty, so when it's processed and turned into fiber, it's great for aeration. So you get a lot of oxygen to your plant's root zone. Pith. Pith is when it's more, is the fiber is when it's shredded. The pith is when it's been shredded and then pulverized. And this is excellent for crops that need good water retention, right? So you need, you need your medium to hold a lot of water for your plants to suck up because it's a water hungry plant. Pith is excellent for that. It resembles peat. So if you've ever went and bought some peat moss from the local garden store, one of modernistic those, or whoever, it resembles that very closely. When it is processed and turned into chips, this is chunks of cocoa coir that are great for potting mixes, as well as it can be used for mulching purposes. Now, when using cocoa coir, when you purchase it, if the package does not say that it is pre-buffered, you definitely want to wash it. And the reason for this is it can definitely alter, um, it can have a pH effect on your plants. So when the water is added to it, it may not stay neutral. It may actually go up in alkalinity or down in acidity. So you definitely want to wash it. Now, thankfully, most Coca-Cola products come already pre-buffered, meaning it's already been washed. Uh, at the picture to the bottom, you see that the Coca-Cola is compressed in a block. This is an efficient way to purchase it if you're purchasing it from abroad because you can, get, you can then get it at a low price and you get a lot of it. So that one block right there can actually expand, expand very, very wide. So what you would do to expand it is, let's say you have a Rubbermaid container, you would drop that block in there, add water, and it will then begin to expand and you just help it set into probably what looks like five times the amount that you see there. Another 
reason why I like to highlight cocoa coir is because it is actually locally manufactured right here in the Bahamas by a company called the Coconut Factory. The owner of the Coconut Factory is actually a very good friend of ours. We talk with them regularly and they create an excellent product. So if you have a chance, check them out. Coconut Factory, you check out their Facebook page or their website. Perlite. Perlite is another very common medium found when um, using hydroponic methods. And what perlite, perlite is, is superheated volcanic glass. Don't worry, it won't touch you, but definitely you don't want to breathe it in. And it's also used in soil production. What perlite is, and what, it, what it's used for basically is it helps to lighten media. So it's an excellent media to add to something like coco coir. So let's say you have coco coir pith, which holds a lot of water. That pith can, can be long. So you want to create access to oxygen within it for your plant's roots. So perlite is an excellent way to do that. And the reason for that being is it's a very, very porous product. It's even more porous than hydrogen, which I mentioned first. Right? Perlite also provides excellent drainage. It is a common ingredient found in potting mixes. So when you go to the garden store, you buy a bag of soil, a bag of garden soil or a potting mix, you pour it out, and what do you see? A bunch of little white specks. That is perlite. Alrighty, perlite is sterile. So the reason why this is important is you don't want your media to have the potential to carry and harbor diseases that could be passed on to your plants. These are things well, that you are planning to consume. Now that we talked about, we've covered pH and TDS, and we've covered hydroponic substrates. We're going to move on to hydroponic nutrients themselves shortly, but before going on to nutrients, it is highly important to understand NPK. So what is NPK? NPK refers to the number of ratios found on nutrients and fertilizer products. So if you ever went into the garden store and you bought a bag of soil or maybe some sort of fertilizer and on that bag you saw three numbers. It may have said something like 432 or just some random numbers. That is your NPK ratio and what that is telling you is the, num the percentage of macro in that product. We'll go over that in a, on the next screen. So macronutrients, right? So the N in NPK stands for nitrogen, the P for phosphorus, and the K for potassium. It's the periodic table, periodic symbol, uh, periodic table symbol for potassium. Right, and these are the mac macronutrients that will be inside the nutrient to feed your plants when using hydroponic nutrients. Right, so like I said, and for nitrogen, and this is to promote proper foliage growth with your plants. Phosphorus is to assist your plants in producing nice fruit. So, if you're growing something like tomatoes, you definitely want some phosphorus in there. Right, and pota potassium helps to develop overall root formation and overall plant growth and health. So they're very important. There are other things such as micronutrients and trace minerals and stuff like that, but we're focusing on right now are the micronutrients because these are what you will see when you go out to purchase your hydroponic nutrients. So an example of this, if you look at the picture to the top, you see it says 216. What that is telling you is Inside that bottle is 2% nitrogen, 1% phosphorus, and 6% potassium. Alrighty, so this is an example of what a hydroponic nutrient product shelf would look like. And there are many, many, many options to choose from, right? Okay, so and another thing to keep in mind with hydroponic hydroponic nutrients is that they can be single You uh, reverse the function for potassium and phosphorus. Mm -hmm. 
You have reversed the function, from my knowledge, you have reversed the functions for phosphorus and potassium. All righty. Well, I guess we could discuss it further at the end of the um, presentation. But hey, if I am wrong, I am happy to be corrected. No issues there with me. I'm here to learn just like you, although I'm departing knowledge. So thank you very much for your input, sir. All righty. Hydroponic nutrients. These are, okay, so where was I now? So they can be single or multi-part, right? What I mean by that is you can buy a hydroponic nutrient product and it can be an all-in-one product that will provide all of your plant's nutrition. You mix the correct ratio in some water, add it, uh, you know, stir it up inside your tank and you're good to go. They can also be multi-part, meaning it can be broken down into different levels. So you may have one part that would be known as a grow formula. This is mainly to provide nitrogen to promote foliage. And then you have the rest of the MPK scale where the other parts would come in. You have a lot, like I said before, you have a large variety of hydroponic nutrients out there to choose from, right? Now, one thing I want you to keep in mind when purchasing hydroponic products is that it's usually best to purchase the dry products, um, especially when you're purchasing um, from a foreign entity, simply because liquid is very heavy. It can either be liquid or dry, right? When it's dry, it comes in like a powder. Liquid just means it's already pre-mixed and you just add it to the water, stir it a bit, with the dry nutrient, you have to add it in and then stir it quite well. And sometimes you may even have to create what you call a stock solution first. Now, alrighty, so keep that in mind when you're purchasing the hydroponic nutrients, especially if you're looking to grow commercially, it's usually best to go for the dry product as opposed to the liquid. Alrighty. Contrary to popular belief, most people usually believe that hydroponics is all synthetic, chemical-based, and for the most part, you are correct. 90% or even more of the hydroponic nutrient market is comprised of synthetic formulations. However, there are a few organic options out there for those of you that prefer to grow organically, which I hope is most of you. Now, one thing about growing organically that I want to mention um, in hydroponics is it does come at a cost. You will have to do more maintenance to your system simply because organics have a tendency to clog small tube lines, which most hydroponic systems have. So keep that in mind. And you'll also probably have to use more of the product than you would a synthetic product. So these are some examples of hydroponic nutrients here. The ones at the top, when I first started growing hydroponically in my apartment, uh, the Floral Grow series is actually the first hydroponic nutrient that I used and I successfully grew lettuce as well as, what else did I grow? Bok choy and stuff like that. Successfully grew them indoors using that product there. And that is a liquid product. Um, at the bottom, there's another product that I highly recommend. Um, I actually recommend it over the product to the top. And that is the Master Blend for 1838 formula. The one in this picture is the 151225, which will do pretty well as well for vegetable production. And that can actually be used as a one part formula, which is what I want to um, point out here as well. If you notice at the top, it's three different bottles. That's because one bottle is high. One bottle is more for foliage production. That's the first one there that is known as a grow formula. And then you also have the micronutrient formula, which is the bottle in the middle. And then you have your bloom formula, which is the one to the right. And you would have to mix each of these into your reservoir in different ratios. And the directions will be on the bottle. It'll say like 
one tablespoon per gallon, probably not even that much because these are concentrated. Whereas the product at the bottom is an example of a dry hydroponic nutrient. You will literally take whatever the suggested measurement is on the box, add it to your tank, stir it in, and you're good to go. Well, actually that says two part there, but it does come in a one part formula. All righty. See if it's anything that I missed here. All righty. So why are organic hydroponic nutrients uncommon? Well, they tend to be a bit more expensive than the synthetic ones. It takes a bit more to um, formulate them. So the cost is a bit higher. They will usually come in liquid form. Yeah, they won't usually be in, actually I've never seen them in a dry form. So shipping them can be quite expensive if you're looking to grow commercially on a, and on a large production scale. As stated previously, organic hydroponic nutrients can actually clean these systems if highlighted via maintenance because you have to do a bit more maintenance to keep the systems clean and operating correctly. And like I said before, you typically have to use a bit more of the product. So the most common organic line of hydroponic nutrients, uh, there are this brand here on the screen, General Organics. There are quite a few other brands out there, but if you were to type in organic hydroponic nutrients, this is more, li more than likely the line of products that will be displayed firstly on your screen. Alrighty, so let's move on to different types of hydroponics. Alrighty, so you have nutrient film technique. Alrighty, so this is a hydroponic technique where in a very shallow stream of water is contained all of the dissolved nutrients that you've added to your tank that is required for proper plant growth. It is a recirculating system, right? So the bare, the bare roots of the plants hang down and they hang inside of this very shallow film of water, right? And it's usually inside a gully. And people that build these, this type of system themselves, it, it'll probably be some PVC pipe, right? Now, <clears throat> it is currently the most common method of commercial hydroponic production. So if you were to type in hydroponics right now into Google, more than likely you will see a picture similar to what you see at the bottom right of the screen. It's mainly used for producing short stature plants, right? So you're not going to be growing tons of cucumbers and stuff like that inside this type of system. This is mainly for plants and lettuces. You can grow things like bok choy and chard and stuff like that. And those would be the types of crops that you would build or purchase this type of system in order to produce. And I do want to go over some of the parts. So if you look at the top right, you have the channel that I spoke of, the gully. But, but I want you to notice inside the tank there at the bottom, you see it's, it says air stone, and then you have an air pump to the right. These are important for providing oxygen to the nutrient solution in your tank. So if you, you've already added your nutrients in there and that's all fine, but having good oxygen levels inside of the water is excellent. Why did we say oxygen is important? Proper root development. In the picture to the right, you see a Dutch bucket system. This is a and they are also known as cradle buckets. And these are a series of buckets connected in a recirculating water system. So just like with the NFT system, there is a tank with a pump and there can be an air stone and air pump to oxygenate the water. And that is recirculated over and over again. Throughout the system and back to the tank. Back throughout the system, return to the tank. And you can utilize whatever substrate um, you would like. It's, it's, it's your choice. Man, we spoke about things like perlite and hydroton and stuff like that. 
you can utilize those in a beta bucket system. So back to NFT systems, you'd more than likely be using rock wool or hydrogen. Alrighty, this is a system that you're going to be seeing a lot of in the Bahamas today, um, in the very near future, because there's an initiative by the government in which they are actually assisting farmers um, with a these systems to increase production in the country. These are vertical drain to waste systems. Nutrient solution is supplied to all plants in the system and the excess runoff is simply expelled to the ground beneath or via a pipeline. So what happens if you look at the, at, to the top of the system here, you see, you see where it's connected to the tank. A uh, pump then pumps that water up. Water is then delivered to those towers, the pots on those towers, and once it passes through all of those parts, it then goes down to the ground, which is why it's called drain to waste. And, but the thing is, it doesn't, the, the nutrient uh, solution actually doesn't have to be wasted. In the picture to the top right, you can see that there are pots at the bottom of the towers and plants can be placed inside those pots to actually be fed by the nutrient solution that would be the runoff from the top pots. Alrighty. Uh, and you can also, let's say even if you don't have the pots at the bottom, you can actually fine tune the way your pump, your pump operates so that you actually waste little to no water at all, right? And, then, and as seen in the pictures, this is typically used in vertical tower systems. So last form of hydroponic systems that we look at, and keep in mind there are many but these are the most common ones found in the world today and I'm also focusing on things that you can easily build yourself right so deep water culture this is probably the easiest of the systems although it requires the most water so deep water culture is a hydroponic method of plant production by means of suspending the plant roots in a solution of nutrient-rich oxygenated water and it's an excellent option for beginners. How do I know? Because it is the option that I started with. So the picture to the top right is intentional because that is the system that I built for myself. Now that isn't my picture, but that is the exact type system that I built for myself when I was st first started starting out with hydroponics. And that is how I grew lettuce and bok choy inside of my apartment. So if you look at that picture, it's simply similar to a Rubbermaid tote, which you can use a Rubbermaid tote, filled with water with nutrients added to it. The plants sit at the top of the lid inside what you call net cups, and the roots are suspended inside of the water with an air stone at the bottom and an air pump to provide oxygen to it. So those little clear lines that are going to those bins, that's actually the connection to the air pump that will oxygenate the water. Very simple to build, and you can literally build this right now by going to somewhere like Kelly, Kelly's or Quality Home Center and purchasing the components. Very easy to do. The top left picture is a more large scale operation um, that can be set up in any backyard as well. It would obviously cost a bit more, but it can be done and it's rather simple to do. At the bottom left is an example of a deep water culture system that can be purchased. You can actually go on Amazon right now and you, this will probably be one of the first results to pop up. And as you can see, it doesn't have to be like beds or bins. It can be any container that can hold a nice depth of water anywhere between eight to 12 inches minimum. Alrighty. Oh, and the bottom picture on the left, that's actually, actually an example of an air pump. That is actually the air pump there that will oxy oxygenate the water in those buckets. So if you want to build that yourself, go to any bakery, ask for some buckets, build out your system. Instructions are very simple to find online, and then you know where to reach us at Grow Life. So what do we use? Well, we use kind of a hybrid system. And this is also a system that we distribute at GrowLife. We actually sell this system. This is called the AutoPot system and it is manufactured in Europe. 
and we were lucky and fortunate enough to be granted the distributorship of the system. And the pictures that you see to the right are actually pictures of the system being utilized at our farm inside our shade house, growing beefsteak tomatoes. At the bottom left is a system that we have set up a client in the back of her yard in which she used, she's using a system right now to produce eggplants and peppers. The beauty of this system is, unlike a lot of other hydroponic systems, um, the water is not recirculating and it does not drain to waste. So every ounce of water is utilized. So there's no water wasted. So there's 100% water efficiency. The water is fed through the blue tank seen in the picture, um, goes through tubing and then goes to trays. So if you look at the bottom left, there are trays. I mean, at the top left, there are trays. And um, pots for a two gallon to four gallon pots sit inside those trays. And there is a device called an aqua valve that controls all of the water levels in the trays. So there's no risk of over or under watering. The system also requires no electricity, pumps, or timers. And that is the system that we use ourselves and we love it. However, as seen before, the drain to waste system um, is being facilitated by the government in collaboration with farmers and soon we will have this at our farm as well and we cannot wait to showcase it to you all. Now, we have we are coming we have come we have reached the end of my presentation i am going to be quite happy to take on all of your questions but before i go what i want to highlight is probably the most important um fact in this segment and that is when you go and you take this knowledge now and you go and try this yourself or go and get training to do it what I want you to keep in consideration is this. Get your kids involved. This is very important. Um, so as I mentioned before, you saw a picture of myself as well as a picture of Carlene. The top two pictures are of my children and the two bottom pictures are Carlene's grandchildren. And they are on the farm every day and each of them knows their job. That day they were harvesting tomatoes from our system that we utilize at the farm. So yes, please get your children involved, learn together and grow them up in the field of agriculture so that one day we can truly be independent because the country that can feed itself is the country that is truly independent. Thank you all so much for taking the time out to listen to and watch this presentation today. And you can see our contact information at the bottom of the screen and we are and I am now happy to take on any questions and answer to the best of my ability. Thank you. All right, uh, Jermaine, thank you for that. Um, and as we get into questions, I'll first address the questions that were coming up um, in the chats during the presentation. Mm -hmm. First one uh, for clarification, um, someone was asking about the pH, the pH too high, uh, the, the solution you use in, mm -hmm. in more clarification for that. I remember you mentioning there was a, a solution for if the pH is too high to bring it down, I think, and then one, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So it's just as simple as um, using pH up if the pH is too low and the pH down if the pH is too high, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite simple. Um, and for example, an organic way to do this, you could actually add lime juice to water to say, make the water, the, the nutrient solution more acidic. You can do that. But um, usually when growing hydroponically, you just have on hand a bottle or two of pH up and pH down. So like I said before, you test your pH with your meter, your meter will then come out and say, okay, maybe your pH is three. So now you know it's a bit too acidic and you need to bring it up. So you'd simply slowly add pH up, insert your pH meter or pen and 
you will slowly see it rise and you just do this continually until you see it arise at the level that you want it to be. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, another question someone was asking, I'm not sure if this uh, PDF or presentation is available outside of this um, Zoom meeting? Yes, I will make it available. I'll provide it um, via our website as well as I will be sending a copy of this to Mr. Paul to provide out to the church. Sorry about the background noise. That would be the kids you saw in the pictures at the end. Okay. Um, which, and I guess this would come into more research on their part, but someone is also asking, Cooper is asking, which macronutrients are needed for various plants? All. Uh, plants will need all of them to grow properly. So you'll need your nitrogen, your phosphorus, potassium. Now, different plants will need, will need different levels. So let's say you're growing something like bok choy or lettuce, which is what I started out with. You definitely want a good amount of nitrogen in there because they are leafy green, so they're mainly producing foliage, correct? So, so um, it just it really just matters on what it is you want to grow, understand what you want to grow, and understand the plant's needs. Okay. And what these? This is a question from Griffin. What these? What the fruits are? I guess generally the plants from this process be considered non-GMO? Yes, they can actually, because when it comes to GMO, it isn't the process that makes them GMO. What makes the plants GMO are genetic engineering of plant varieties of seeds and stuff like that, when they crossbreed seeds and, and even cross, um, crossbreeding plants isn't fully considered GMO. So that, that's an entirely different topic. So the answer to that question is a resounding no. Okay. And I will say though, okay. there are some differences that may be found when growing hydroponically as compared to growing in soil. For example, um, sometimes plants grown hydroponically, uh, hydroponically may not have as an earthy taste as plants grown in soil. However, this can be altered if you were to grow them using an organic hydroponic nutrient. So that's some stuff we can say. Okay. Um, the other two questions I could just combine because they kind of um, in the same realm. Um, but where, where would someone purchase the nutrients? And I guess that would tie into what the initial cost for a project like this um, would cost someone, I guess, and that's a question from Griffin, and I guess that's more so considering, you know, someone who wants to do, you know, start up for, this, for themselves. Well, well, the thing is, um, typically hydroponics, um, hmm, how can I put it? Hydroponics, when you first start out, um, is definitely usually more expensive than when you grow with soil, simply because you usually have to purchase a system and then your nutrients. Whereas to grow with soil, you can literally just go to the garden store, grab a bag, a pot and mix, grab a pot, stick the plant in and water it, right? Um, of course, you still need to fertilize it properly and stuff like that. But it's usually a simpler and cheaper process. But you should always keep in mind the advantages of hydroponics that I mentioned earlier. Um, now, and so in terms of cost for hydroponic system, it all depends on the route that you go. What I would suggest starting out, and it does allow for you to gain a significantly better understanding of what you're doing, not that growing hydroponically is difficult, but it does come with practice just like anything else. Um, I suggest attempting to build the system yourself or have someone guide you through it. Or you can purchase a pre-built system. You, I've actually seen hydroponic systems on Amazon for as low as just over hundred dollars, right? So it isn't crazy expensive, right? Um, but I do recommend trying to build it from scratch. Yeah. Okay. Or, and, or and would you, come to go okay. live and purchase one from us. <laughs> and 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 would you um, recommend? 
Well, let me let me ask this before I get into the other questions. And I think some persons um, might have had some more insight into it as well. Mm -hmm. But what kind? And it might be a heavy question. You can let me know. What are the main differences between hydroponics and aquaponics? Well, the thing about um, aquaponics to remember is well, the main difference is okay, hydroponics. Um, you're feeding the plants via, via nutrients that you supply. You go out and you purchase a hydroponic nutrient, whether it be synthetic or organic, or you go and, um, or, or with aquaponics, where the plants are being fed through the, the waste of fish, right? Which is then filtered and passed on to the tanks in which the plants reside. So that's the main difference right there. With hydroponics, you supply the nutrients via hydroponic nutrient products. With aquaponics, the plants are being fed their nutrients via the waste um, of fish. Um, one thing to keep in mind, um, a lot of people like to talk, of, talk about the two as two very separate entities. While, while they are separate, the term hydro stands, you know, it's, it's water. And that's where all the different phonics come from. Right, so you have hydroponics, aquaponics, bioponics. You got about a million different type of ponics out there. Aer aeroponics. So don't get so swayed with the labels. Just choose a method and go with it. Okay, I understand. Um, and the main reason I ask that is because, like you said, you know, a lot of people tend to get, um, you know, they sway either one way or the next in terms of um, which one they should go into. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks for clarification on that. Um, someone, another question, someone was asking about the particulars about plants to grow this time of year with shade cloth. I'm not sure if they're meaning specifically um, with regards to hydroponics. Um, utilizing shade cloth is always a good idea simply because, well, we live in the Bahamas. Right, so um, at the farm, we also grow in soil beds. We have a lot of in-ground and raised beds and we have irrigation line on those to provide the water, right? And automated irrigation is key to growing in the summer in which many farms in the Bahamas actually shut down production simply because it's very difficult to produce in the summer. However, at Grow Life, if we don't shut down ever, simply because of that we can grow year round in this country, even though it takes a bit a bit more effort and investment definitely be done. Um, now with hydroponics, the whole thing is you're, you're growing your plants in water. So part of um, um, the need for constant hydration is already supplied via hydroponics. Where the, sh where the shade claw comes in is, is just another positive attribute in which you don't have that glaring sun, you know, beating down on your plants all day. And when you utilizing shea cloth idea for vegetable production and leafy grain production, um, you always want to consider your the percentage of shea cloth that you use. Many people will go out and just buy any shea cloth. If the shea cloth is too dark, the plants won't be able to photos photosynthesize properly. A uh, perfect um, percentage that we have found and that we utilize at the farm um, is in, in the pictures on the shade house that you saw is 40%. So, um, yeah, I want okay. to keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. And um, our last, well, second to last question, um, is it best, and I guess you kind of answered this already, um, but is it best to plant in soil or water? Soil or water? To be honest, there's no, there, there's, you can do well in either, to be honest. We, we do both, right? It, all it is, keep in mind, all they are are uh, different mediums and methods of growing a crop. You can grow broccoli in soil. You can grow broccoli. No, 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 let me change that. You can grow lettuce in soil. You can grow it hydroponically. It's all a matter of what you prefer. Um, there's no way of saying which one is better. Sometimes you could get a better product from the soil, sometimes you get a better you can get a better product um, growing hydroponically. Um, we grow most of our lettuce in the soil, 
but it, let's say if we did have an NFT system, I would probably opt to grow it hydroponically simply because I'd be able to grow more lettuce in a smaller amount of space. So it really just depends on your preference. Um, me trying, me sitting here and telling you one is better than the other, I'd be lying to you. Yeah, understandable. Um, some general questions about where Grow Life is located. Um, someone is asking, and I see you have your website and your contacts up, um, but I don't know if you want to speak to that specific question. Okay. Alrighty, so um, you can find our location via our website, but I'll, I'll say it on here as well. We are located in Chippingham, Infant View Road West of Dunmore Avenue. So um, it's directly opposite, see my race Mean society, directly opposite Four Seasons Nursery. Um, you'll see a two-story yellow building with a sign out front that reads Fort Charlotte Academy. And the reason for that is, yes, it used to be a school. We have turned the, the school grounds into an urban farm. Now, in terms of visiting the farm, we won't be allowing visitors right now because we just had the storm. And to put it blatantly, um, bluntly, it's a bit torn up at the moment. <laughs> Even though the storm wasn't so bad, the crops are pretty beat up and we have a lot of cleanup to do. And we're going to be utilizing this time to do so. Yeah, and that was, um, that was a question that I had um with regards to the setup because i have i have a backyard farm but it's like in the soil and my hesitation Please invite me to come and see it I, I always love to visit people's gardens and farms yeah yeah for sure and i think um you know with the pandemic and everything people kind of was getting back to the soil and growing so it was one of my um kind of various ventures and when I was thinking about aquaponics or hydroponics, you know, interchange between the two, the concern for me um, was that during hurricane season, that it would be, I mean, as opposed to, you know, everything is going to get, you know, torn up or whatever, um, especially delicate like plants. Um, what difficulty um, have you guys had as it relates to the systems, because I know there's a lot of systems in place. You have the, you know, the greenhouse set up and, you know, the various um, pots that aren't necessarily like bolted down, but I don't know, like the hardcore setup you guys have there. Um, has it been difficult kind of like maintaining that? I mean, seeing as though we just went through not a hurricane, hurricane here, but we had a lot of, um, you know, gust winds. Um, so I don't know if you could share a little bit more insight into that, I guess, more about what that entails. Alrighty. <clears throat> now, oh, in terms of maintaining the system, uh, well, let me, let me speak about the um, storm aspect of, of it first. Uh, the video of the system that we utilize, the autopod system, um, it can be disassembled and the plants are literally growing in pots. So to protect our plants, we literally just took the pots out and took the whole system inside. So there was absolutely no damage or even any risk to the system at any time. And tomorrow we'll be spending that time putting the system back in the shade house and we'll be back up and running like nothing ever happened. Um, um, in terms of, I'm trying to remember the next part. Oh, maintenance. And, in terms of maintenance, um, I'll speak from experience there. But when we first started out with our system, <laughs> kind of would forget about the maintenance, but you do pay the price because your plants will start to talk to you. They won't look as healthy, they start to wilt a bit. And you'd be like, hey, what's going on here? And then you check the tank and it looks kind of dirty. Then you realize, oh, I'm supposed to empty this tank, flush the system, clean it out, and get it, get it back going again. For the system that we utilize, we clean it, we clean, we do our maintenance, our regular maintenance on the system once per week. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, and I see, thank you for that answer. I see we have a couple hands in the chat. I'm not sure who is Galaxy J4. 
I didn't get that. Could you try again? Mm -hmm. Who wants to try again? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. It's my um my phone. Um okay. Patricia has a question. Not sure if she is going if she has a mic available or if she is going to ask a question in the chat. It's Patricia. Okay. Is that DP? Oh, or? which which Patricia? Um Patricia Thompson. Patricia and some um McSweeting. McSweeney. No, that's not me. I'll unmute again. Okay. Um, we also have uh, Deborah Delani, whose hand is up in the, the chat. All righty. Oh, Ms. Delaney. Yes, I, I, do miss, I do know Ms. Delaney. How are you doing, Ms. Delaney? <laughs> Not sure if she's hearing me. Let me see. Um, am I supposed to um, click on their names or something? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm clicking. I just trying to get their attention. Not sure if, if they're aware right now. I'm here. Okay. Hey, Hello. Delaney. Hi, Jermaine. Very good hey, presentation. Hey. Thank you. <laughs> and you were correct. P is potassium, and K is phosphorus. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, we also we also have a one second. Let's make sure I get everybody. We also have a Dixon. With their hand up. Hi, good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Hey, good sir. day. Hi, how are you doing? I am well, okay. thank you. Okay, uh, the question that I had um, in terms of the hydroponics versus soil. Mm -hmm. Everybody, but basically everybody growing organic now, is there a big difference in the nutrients, value of the crops that you produce? by uh, hydroponics versus soil? Okay, I'll, I'll answer that um, honestly. And we, I, I did touch on it in the presentation a bit. So when it comes to nutrients and uh, growing hydroponically, probably more than 90% of the market is comprised of synthetic fertilizers, right? And right. the issue with synthetic fertilizers are that they mainly only focus on the macronutrients. And sometimes they may not include micronutrients. They may not include trace minerals and stuff like that. However, there are some out there that do. So it really depends on you to do your research into what you're purchasing. For example, the hydroponic nutrient that I displayed earlier. Um, let me see if I can pull it up on the screen again. So the Floral Grow um, series from General Hydroponics, if you look at the middle bottle, it actually says advanced, my, um, advanced nutrients, nutrient system, and it's called flora, flora micro because that one actually does supply micronutrients to your crops, right? Now, right. also keep in mind in terms of growing organically, can you grow or, or um, using organic nutrients in hydroponics? As stated during the presentation, yes, you can. Um, it's up to you to go out and look for those um, organic nutrients on the screen right now is an example of a line of organic nutrients for hydroponic growing. However, do keep in mind when growing organically in hydroponics, the, the level of maintenance is kicked up. You have to do more maintenance rather than when you use the synthetic fertilizers. And that's simply because it's organic, you're using organic products. So, clogging think about the small tubings the quarter inch tubings and stuff like that and in the system they can be clogged very easily so maintenance is of the utmost importance and you have to be on top of it when using organic nutrients okay one more quick question um but it is control. worth it to grow organically 
Mm-hmm. Okay, one more quick question. Um, with the pest control hydro, hydro with the hydroponic system, I mm-hmm. saw you had um water diseases, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how do you how would you treat go about treating that? Okay, so um, let's pick a common a common disease found at the root zone in hydroponics would be something called fusarium root rot, and it's exactly what it says. The roots develop a fungus that then causes them to decay and rot, and that is passed throughout the system or through the water supply. So if you're, so let's say you're using something like an NFT system, right? Or a system that recirculates. It's more of a concern because that's going to each and every single, if you're doing NFT, it's going all through that gully or that channel. So every plant will eventually be affected, especially if you're not able to identify it soon enough. Now, how do you avoid that? Simply maintaining the system. Another way to mitigate is to utilize a system such as what we utilize at our farm, the auto part system. I'll pull that up on the screen right now. The beauty about this is each of those trays are isolated, right? And because they're isolated, if a disease was to develop in the root zone inside in the parts in one of those trays, that system does not recirculate, right? And the water never goes back. So because that is the case, only the parts in that tray would be affected. Yeah, daddy on the, daddy on the computer, go to mama. That's my baby. But yeah, does that answer your question? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you one quick question, sir? Mr. Barrett? Mr. Barrett? Can I ask a quick question? Hello? All right. Yes. Turn quick. Oh, maybe Um, you're talking to someone else. All right. My hand is still up. Um, We're trying to address the hands um, first. If you could raise your hand then I would know where you are in the queue and I will let you um, go as soon as everybody else is done. Because we have a few, we have a few other persons whose hands are raised and persons who ask questions, other questions in the chat that I need to um, get to first. The next person I have here whose hand is raised is Devo. It just says D.P. Devo. I'm here. Hi. Okay. Hi, Ms. DeVoe. How are you? I am well. Okay. I have been growing, um, trying to grow organically in my yard. I have a little backyard farm. I just recently put up a shade house and I want to grow uh, hydroponically in there. Mm -hmm. Um, But I have a question. I have uh, some 55 gallon drums that I was well, you know, we go on um, YouTube and Google a lot and you get a lot of information. And mm-hmm. I saw where this gentleman was growing watermelons out of this drum without any sort of um, uh, recirculating um, yeah, system. Yes. How viable is that? Um, actually, it depends on how he designed the system. So. The reason, I, the reason I say that is because, and do remind me, I have a question about your shade house. Um, the, the reason, for, it, it all depends on how, how he has a design. He may have it set up as a deep water culture system, as I yes. showed before. I think that's um, that, that can definitely work. That can definitely work. And with that, with that depth of water, he could probably maybe go, go away for a few days to a week and and not have to worry about his um um what's the word I'm, his crops right his watermelons now the way if i was using a 50 gallon barrel um i wouldn't use it to do that but what i would be using it i would utilize and i didn't have that presented in this presentation it's a bit more advanced but i would design it to be an aeroponic system in which there would be pvc um piping work done inside the barrel and, and it would have misters attached to the PVC pipe to spray out the solution on, onto the plant roots and it'll have a bunch of holes all around the barrel with the plants plugged into those holes. And the, root, the, the plant hanging on the outside and the root of the plant on the inside 
being misted by these sprayers. That's how I would design it. But yes, um, what you described is is definitely doable. Um, however, it wouldn't be the method that I would go about using. Okay. Does that answer your question? That answers my question and it uh, introduces um, something. It, it looks like the towers. We are some talking about something similar to the tower type setup. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Okay. What I, what the solution that I, that I described that I would use, the aeroponic solution, yes. that would yes. be an example of a tower, converting okay. the barrel into a tower. So well, um, I, when, when, when you come off of this tonight, um, look it up, look up aeroponics and you'll get a better idea. You can also reach out to me. I'll be glad and happy to share more information with you. I do have a question about the shade, the, your um, shade house. What, what percent of shade cloth are you using? I have no idea. I just went to the store and they gave me a green one. I, they, I asked them what percentage it was. They couldn't tell me. And I didn't know, you know, at that yeah. time they had a green, they had a black and they had a kind of tan color. Yeah, if, if the, that's the thing. Even the colors of shea cloth can have an effect on plant growth. Um, mm -hmm. Green is fine, but I just want you the next time, keep in mind the percentage, go for 40% if you can, if you're looking to grow vegetables. Right, because it's it's very shady in there. It's very cool, mm -hmm. you know, without is any... It, is, is it kind of dark? It's, yeah, it's... Um, it's... Yeah, it's dark. I have I have some tomato plants growing in there now, and plants are growing, but I don't mm -hmm. think cucumbers grow very well in there because there's not enough sun. Possibly, possibly. Sun-loving um, plants won't do very well. Well, in there, in, no. Under the dark, very dark shade cloth. So something like 80% is definitely out of the question. You don't want that. Well, I'm not quite finished with it. And so that's why I definitely will reach out to you after this. Um, I need some help in completing it. And I'm um, getting stuff ready for, for September. Understood. Thank you. Thank you, too. Okay, and I just I just want to address um, a question. I guess I could compound the two questions, and it's basically what I guess before the storm, what kind of um, crops um, you guys were growing um, at Grow Life, and what kind of fruits can you actually um, grow with the system, with the hydroponic system. Already now another thing to keep in mind with hydroponics um, Like I said, you always consider what you want to grow You can definitely grow things like peppers and tomatoes and stuff like that Egg plants as long as the plants are not very large, but you're not looking to grow trees So you're not going to be growing hog plum or something inside your hydroponic system. Keep that in mind You're not going to be growing oranges or, or, or peaches or something like that um tomatoes do well as you can see in the picture on the screen um you can grow like i said you can grow different varieties of peppers and eggplants you can grow cucumbers cucumbers do very well and uh, melons as well can be grown hydroponically um would you how can i put it um so yeah when it comes to purchasing purchasing your system um and i'll, I'll highlight this again always consider what it is you want to produce so you go and purchase an NFT system, but you're not looking to grow lettuce. You, you want to grow tomatoes and cucumbers. You're not going to do very well because the root systems of those plants grow very large and they will clog up the channels. So um, just keep that in mind. Yeah, and I also want to make mention that we do have the Prime Minister's address that is supposed to be at eight. So we have four more hands raised and I think we could just if we could get through those last questions really quickly um, just so for those who need to who, who would like to watch the address and keep up to date with that they can um, so the next person we have whose hands raised is Wilson Elsa Wilson are you there yes I'm here I'm okay. here um, yeah, so very interesting presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering, I've been actually trying, I have a tiny little um, deep water culture um, system in my backyard that looks very similar to the one that you have, but I'm using um, fish, I'm doing aquaponics. So um, I was wondering 
the grow pot system that you guys are selling, how does that work without um, pumps and stuff? You're not recirculating the water. Uh, you said the water is not wasted. Is, is it by gra is it gravity fed? I was just wondering how how that works. Yes. Okay. So basically, it is a gravity fed system. So as you saw um, on the screen, I'll pull it back up. Um, the tank there to the back of the shade house. That is a 105 gallon tank. We do go up to 200 gallon tanks. All of the nutrient solution is in that tank, passed down the tubing that, that you would see in between the pots there, the pots and the trays. Mm -hmm. And inside of, of each of those trays, the way the water is managed is by a device called the aqua valve. And essentially what that does is it simply determines and regulates the water levels in the tray for the plants to consume. So once it detects that it is empty, the valve opens up. It, it's just like a float valve, essentially. It opens up, okay. allows more nutrient solution into the tray. Once the plant completely consumes it, um, it, um, it would then do the same thing all over again. And that, the beauty of that is the plants, each plant is basically regulating its own feeding schedule. So as stated before, you mitigate the risk of overfeeding or underfeeding. Okay, and those barrels that you're using, do you sell those separately or do you, are you, do you have to purchase the entire system? At the moment, we sell it uh, with the system and that is the, the tank is actually a flexi tank. So it isn't, mm -hmm. it isn't solid plastic. Once that mm -hmm. is empty, you can literally fold that up like cloth and put it away. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm looking for uh, like a hundred gallon thing to put my fish in. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. Yeah, and so and so at this time of year, you're growing tomatoes. I mean, I have a little hoop house, a tiny little hoop thing with, um, I'm also like the previous person who bought shade cloth but doesn't know what percentage it is. Um, mm -hmm. But so my cucumbers are growing. My basil was doing very well. But, you know, the, you know I'm just wondering what time, you know, this time of year, what I should be planting. Well, if you're going the hydroponic or aquaponic route, you can plant whatever you want. Um, if, if you're set up correctly with your system and, and, the, sh and the proper shading, mm -hmm. right? You can go whatever you want. So like, for example, right now, like, like you see in the pictures, we are growing um, tomatoes, right? We're growing tomatoes. Mm -hmm. And most people this time of year, uh, many, many people wouldn't even try. But um, this is simply proof that, yes, it can definitely be done. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So when you guys are back up, I would love to come and see your your setup. Please do. Okay, and we have next. I don't know who is Samsung Galaxy. Um, that's the next raised hand in the chat. Hi. Good evening. Um, my name is Khadija, and I. I just had a quick question. I had put it in the chat, but I'll just mention it now. So it's about, um, you mentioned in your presentation that power outages are one of the cons of hydroponic systems. Is there, what, what, what do you do in your, in your system? I know you mentioned you have aquapots, but when you started out, for example, with a deep water culture system, what would you suggest in a situation where, like, for example, this weekend where we had power outages for more than like 12 hours in some areas. Um, I heard some persons, they use solar panels, but um, what can, can you give me any tips? Yes, definitely. Um, solar is definitely a solution and, and it doesn't have to be expensive solar. You can literally go on Amazon right, right now. For example, our, um, our my, the power at my home where I'm at now is, it was off all weekend. It just came on at 9 a.m. this morning. So I had a very, a very short period of time to actually put this presentation together for you. Um, but you can, you can use um, um, battery power banks, right? Um, that's, that's an option. And you can have your pump connected to those. You can, you, and th those go with solar. So you can get one of those with a solar panel combo and that will work well. Um, the simplest solution, um, at least what I feel is a simple solution, like uh, with our system that we utilize at the farm, and for example, we install for the client there at the bottom left, no electricity pumps or timers are required. So 
BPL isn't, isn't a concern, and I think that's a wonderful thing, because as we are, all know, BPL ain't your friend. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks much. I appreciate it. All right. Um, the next we down to like the last three hands up. So the next person is Mr. Porter, Albert. And Mr. Porter. Are you there? Yes, just for, thanks for your presentation. Um, I just have a clarification. Mm -hmm. I thought that um, phosphorus was for root development. But if I'm not mistaken, from your presentation, you mentioned that potassium is for root development and phosphorus for um, fruits development. That's, Can you, um, I, mean, I may be wrong, but I mean, just give me what it is now. Well, that, that is uh, my understanding, and um, that's how I've been growing. <laughs> that's how I've been uh, supplementing my tomatoes. So I'm assuming I am correct, but I, um, I'm, I'm, one thing about me, I have no objection to being wrong. So if you are correct, sir, I am 100% with you, but it is my understanding that it is the, the way around that I put it in the presentation. However, um, based on what you're saying, I will double check. And if you are correct, I will definitely edit this document so that when it is sent out to you guys, you get the correct information. But um, like I said, it is how I have been growing um, for some time. So um, if it is incorrect, I don't know, the incorrect way of being working. <laughs> That's it. Um, the, the next question would be coming from Christine Rule. Are you there? Hi. Good night. Good night, um, Michelle. Oh, um, where do you purchase the system from? The piping for the system. Where do you purchase the piping for the system? You mean if you wanted to put a system together yourself? Yeah, the PVC pipe. Oh well, um, in any any plumbing store, but I um, I would have to go go in a bit a bit more in depth to to really explain it to you. But you'd probably be looking for three inch PVC. Um, if you can get thin walled PVC, that'd be good. And then you'd need a hole saw to drill out your your two inch holes, and then you'd need your neck cups. There's there's different components you would need, but you can find the PVC at pretty much any plumbing store. However, if you want to go, if you want to be really um, nit nitpicky about it, you do have what you call food grade PVC as well. But the, the regular PVC works just fine. The regular PVC, okay. Um, try to protect it from the sun as much as you could. So shade cloth would be good when utilizing food. PVC. What? Food grade. Food grade. Yeah. Okay, three inch, okay, ten walls. Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and our last hand up in the chat is from Teresa. Yes, good night. Um, my good question night. was, um, I, you, I saw where they had that um, microorganisms or something that could grow within the water and cause problems, but my main concern is how it's a water-based um, thing that you're talking about. Is there mm -hmm. any chance that like um, tadpoles and things like that could ever form in that? Because I'm afraid of things like that. You know, water <laughs> you cycle like being there. No, I don't. <laughs> yeah, it, there's a possibility. Um, the the, the, the tadpoles like that and stuff, they won't like, they won't like it. Um, simply oh, okay. because of the nutrients that you've, you've added to the water. Oh, um, okay. Yes, yes. Um, Microbiological organisms can form inside water, but mm -hmm. this mainly occurs when you're not doing proper schedule, um, scheduled oh. maintenance. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Thank. Yes. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Okay. Okay. And with that, we have no other questions. I saw some persons had some questions related to your system. Um, but I want to remind everybody that if you visit their website, um, you should have all that information there, correct? Yes, and we will actually be adding a members portal to the website. And what this portal will be 
is it will pretty much be like a blog essentially. And once you sign up, you will have access to freely available in-depth information to assist you with not only hydroponics, but just growing on the whole. On the whole. Thank you very much for your presentation, Jermaine. Uh, thank Rest. We really appreciate the information that you've shared. And thanks a lot for the participants.